recording the presentation. Now it starts recording. Okay, so the talk will be given by, uh, by Kuyang Tang. Uh, so Kuyang, please start the talk. I don't know whether, just a second, probably I have to unmute you. Just a second. So, sorry for all. Ah, it's here. Okay. I hope you can unmute yourself soon. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Okay, now it works. So. Uh, okay. It took a bit uh, of time. Sorry for that. So I shall start. Yeah, please start. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to meet you via Zoom. And uh, today I'm going to talk about our, our paper on asynchronous validated presenting agreement we call our pro protocol Dumbo MVB. I'm Chang, and this joint work with my students, Yuan Zhenliang, and my colleague, Grace. And uh, blockchain gets so popular nowadays, and even the mass media talk about consensus all the time. And as one of the close, closely related uh, notion, atomic broadcasts have been studied in this community for many years. And uh, as you all know, the definition is quite simple. Uh, a bunch of uh, internet peers each have some, uh, have some uh, input transactions. They communicate. They want to reach agreement on some digital lock. Maybe now more fashionable term is called the digital ledger. And normally they satisfy uh, consistency and uh, liveness. Well, in the asynchronous setting, this atomic broadcast problem is more challenging. So for this purpose, Kashin et al. proposed a nice notion nice notion called validated presenting agreement. Uh, it is a BA with uh, external validity, which only output, uh, uh, only uh, uh, requires the output to satisfy some predicate. So that means the output could even come from some malicious party. Well, the nice, nice thing about this MVBA is that it still enables a simple construction to atomic broadcast, even in the asynchronous setting, uh, while this uh, intermediate uh, primitive called the uh, atomic common subset. Uh, before I go into the detail of this MVBA, actually, uh, I would like to take a short detour how we uh, got here. Originally, we were looking at practical asynchronous consensus, and we know it can be obtained from asynchronous common subset. But for this ACS protocol, there are two different passes. The first one can, uh, is uh, from binary, asynchronous binary agreement and plus uh, reliable broadcast, which is due to Bangor at all. And the second pass was uh, proposed by Kashan et al. using this MVPA. Well, in the quite impactful pay, uh, work of Honey Badger BFT, they explicitly chose the first one uh, because they consider MVPA as a major bottleneck because of the large communication complexity. Well, our initial investigation somehow considered this view might be too pessimistic for MVPA. Actually, in our recent work, uh, which will appear in the coming CCS, we gave a construction of atomic broadcast, which using Kashin's at all's original MVP directly, but the resulting atomic broadcast still much, much faster than Honey Badger BFT. So this raised the question, and we think MVP might still be the right way for constructing SS. So for this reason, uh, we want to open the box of the MVP and now push down the communication complexity for MVP itself. That's the focus of this work. Um, so the Kashinado proposed a notion in the same paper, a very nice construction, while they also ex left uh, ex explicit open problem to reduce the communication, communication complexity of the resulting atomic broadcast and also the 
underlying MVBA. As you, 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 you are able to see, there's an n-cubic term here in the communication complexity. That's the place we need to optimize. After many years, and only until last year's policy, Abraham Adol finally made a breakthrough and removed this uncubic factor, which was great news. Um, but if we look at the complexity, uh, the communication complexity formula a little bit more careful, the situation might not be as optimistic as we thought uh, when the input size is not so small. Well, this, this really matters actually in the original motivation to construct this atomic broadcast, the MVBA is actually invoked by everybody, everybody using a vector of input as the MVBA input. So in this sense, the input to the MVBA is actually a, a, a vector which already has containing uh, n elements and is a number of uh, participants. So by doing some simple calculation, we can, <laughs> we can easily see now even the LN squared term becomes cubic again. So essentially, even with the breakthrough of uh, Abraham et al., the ori original question to reduce the communication complexity of Cachin et al.'s atomic broadcast actually remains open, that the real problem is MVB with moderately large inputs still needs to be optimized for communication complexity. So in this work, we bridge this gap and uh, further reduce the communication complexity for a factor of n, and uh, of course, we want to do this uh, to preserve all other benefits of other efficiencies. And actually, it's not very difficult to see that those performance metrics are essentially optimal. Uh, for example, for the communication complexity, if the input is, is uh, moderately large, then actually the whole complex, the formula cannot collapse to the LN factor. And the most important thing is that our double MVP protocols can be now plugged into the uh, original construction of Cachado to get the atomic broadcast, then we can reduce the com actual communication complexity of the atomic broadcast in the asynchronous setting. So for details of the technical things, uh, I would refer to the uh, paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? So let me... Let me see whether there are questions in. So if you have questions, just, just put it into the session three consensus. I also check whether there are questions in Zoom, but I don't see any questions. So I have a very short question. You had this table where you presented uh, where you presented this, uh, these uh, results you had, mm -hmm. exactly this one, uh, the one I have seen, it, exactly this one. And you have this, uh, this lambda is, bit, uh, is basically lambda uh, uh, bit security parameter. Uh, what, is, what is the usual size of this lambda? Uh, here, normally, basically, the, like uh, we measure the security, uh, the the, digital, the size of signature, maybe a hundred bits or thousand bits, something like that. Mm -hmm. Not that much. And normally, it's a system parameter. Okay. Are there further questions? Okay, so I don't see any further questions. So let's go to the next talk. The next talk will be given by Gilad Stern. Uh, I let you. Can you just say something so that we know whether we can hear you or not? Oh no. Hey, can you ah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. So, so uh, the next talk is about revisiting asynchronous fault tolerant computation with optimal resilience. And the talk is given by Gilad. So please, let's start. The talk. Hello, hey everybody. Uh, I'm gonna present the joint work with Tabla Hamid and Dublev. 
Um, in our work, we want to explore asynchronous fault tolerant computation and more specifically how different thresholds and the number of uh, computationally unbounded Byzantine parties can affect which uh, tasks we can and can't solve in this setting. So a little bit of the uh, asynchronous fault tolerance in general. The famed FLP result showed that in an asynchronous network, if even one party might crash, every agreement protocol has some non-terminating execution. And an easy corollary is that an adversary can cause any deterministic agreement protocol to just run forever. On the other hand, we know that there are randomized protocols that almost surely terminate. By almost surely, we mean with probability one. In 1983, uh, Michael Benel, Rankanetti, and the Goldreich uh, showed that any functionality has an almost surely terminating protocol with perfect security if we assume that n is greater than 4t, where t is the number of Byzantine parties. On the other hand, we have lower bounds showing that some functionalities, for example, agreement, are impossible if n is less than or equal to 3t. Now, we want to close this gap somehow. In 1993, Rankanetti and Talrabin showed an asynchronous Byzantine agreement protocol for n greater than 3t. And in 1994, uh, Michael ben Benel, Boaz Kelmer, and Talrabin uh, showed an asynchronous multi-party secure computation for n greater uh, than 3t. Now, both of these works had an annoying property, as they said, that they had a non-zero probability of non-termination. Uh, BKR even provided a sketch of a proof that it is impossible to implement an almost surely terminating asynchronous verifiable secret sharing protocol if we assume that n is less than or equal to 4t. Now, both of these works used AVSS as a building block, so they inherited AVSS's uh, non-zero probability of non-termination. So a little bit of background about AVSS in general and intuition. AVSS is a two-phase protocol. Um, that tries to emulate the following ideal functionality. The first phase is called the share phase. It has a designated dealer, and the dealer has some input S. The first thing the dealer does is send S to the ideal functionality. And then the ideal functionality sends a done message to all parties, after which they all complete the protocol. Now note that throughout this communication, the only two parties that heard anything about S are the dealer and the ideal functionality. So S essentially remains secret throughout the share phase. Then the second phase is called the reconstruct phase, um, starts with everybody sending a ready message to the ideal functionality. And then the functionality replies with the message received in the first phase, in this case, S. Finally, all parties output that value S. The paper um, has two main results. The first one is a lower bound result. For every epsilon between zero and one half, an n which is less than or equal to 4t, there does not exist an almost surely terminating one half plus epsilon correct t resilient Byzantine AVSS protocol. And in this setting, being one half plus epsilon correct means that all non faulty parties are required to um, output the correct value, that is the dealer's input, only with probability one half plus epsilon or, or greater. Uh, th it is important to note this is. Uh, an improvement on the paper we actually submitted to uh, POTSI, and we have a, a more a, a better result in the archive. We will compare this result to um, BKR's result from 1994. Uh, first of all, this is a full proof. BKR had a sketch in 1994, and it hasn't been proven since. So this is a full proof. And secondly, our result actually allows for some probability of error in the AVSS protocol. Now, this is important because the AVSS protocol they used and the ones we have today have some probability of error. So this manages to close some of the gap between the lower bound we, we have and the upper bounds we have. The second result is an upper bound result. Um, there exists an almost surely terminating asynchronous fair Byzantine agreement protocol resilient to fewer than n over three faulty parties. And a fair Byzantine agreement protocol is essentially just the regular Byzantine agreement protocol, except it also has the following fairness property. Um, all non-faulty parties output some non-faulty parties input with probability one half or greater, in addition to all of the other uh, properties of Byzantine agreement. Um, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. 
So thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Julie, I don't see questions in. I see that somebody just wrote that there is a question. Oh, yeah. Um, error and yeah. correctness. What is, what is error and correctness? Correctness means here, yes. So error and correctness means uh, not outputting the correct uh, value. That is, if the dealer is non faulty and sends uh, and has some secret S, um, error and correctness will be outputting anything other than S. It's actually a global, uh, uh, a global, a global property. Everybody has to output that value. Further questions? Um, there a is second no question. Error in privacy law allowed? Yeah, so the, um, the original formalization is that there is absolutely no error in privacy. There is a statistical, um, statistical privacy. And this is definitely a, an area that we want to kind of look at. Can we take some of the uh, error and correctness and kind of move it into error and privacy and receive maybe a stronger result? And almost an almost sure terminating result, for example. So, if there are, uh, there is another question. What if the ideal provide the wrong value? For example, differ in here different from S. So, this was a little um, kind of high level. Um, in general, a non-faulty dealer will always send the correct value and the faulty dealer will send something, not necessarily S, um, but send something. Um, or rather, to be precise, it can either not send anything, in which case we don't have to complete the protocols, or it sends something. And in that, in that stage, uh, the system is bounded to that value. And um, in that case, being uh, the error uh, probability is a situation in which we don't output the value to which the, the system is bounded in high level terms. A more formal definition of the, the exact uh, of AVSS is provided in the full talk and in the paper. Are there further questions? So if there are no further questions, thank you very much. And we can go over to the next talk. The next talk will be given by Louis Seng. And um, I think I'm correct, just a second. Yes, by Louis Seng. And um, I have to unmute him. Hello, can you hear me? It worked quite well and we can okay. hear you. Cool. So, Hello, uh, this is Louis and this is a joint work with my postdoc Dimitris from uh, Boston College and Nitin from Georgetown. And we studied the problem of asynchronous Byzantine approximate consensus and the new angle is that we study this problem in direct network. So let me first describe the model. We have n nodes, up to f of them may be Byzantine. And, uh, and uh, we started this in message passing system and then the system is modeled by a synchronous system. And the communication network is modeled by a directed network that might only be partially connected. And and that each node knows that the network. And we consider this approximate consensus. So because I, we studied this uh, problem in a synchronous system. So let's see. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, let me turn on my ca camera. Thank you. I forgot to do that. Okay, so the approximate consensus that I <clears throat> need to satisfy termination, validity, and absolute agreement. And by validity, meaning that suppose the, this is the, the 
range of the good inputs and then your final output need to be inside a good range. And then at some point of time, each node need to decide its output and the final output need to be bounded above by epsilon. So that's a problem we consider. And this problem has been studied well in a, in a click, meaning in a complete graph. So the first is FLP paper, like it's impossible to achieve exact consensus. And then later, like one year after, there's a JSON paper say that, okay, actually we can use iterative uh, algorithm to solve approximate consensus, but that like N has to be greater than or equal to five F plus one. Here by iterative, meaning that, that each node, it doesn't really forward any kind of message. And then later on like in like 2004, by Ita Abraham, the AAD paper, it, they use a generalized algorithm, basically that uh, each node need to forward message and then need to say that, okay, I received this set of message. And then they, they devise this uh, technique called uh, reliable broadcast and then the witness. And then they are able to show uh, the, to present an uh, algorithm with uh, optimal resilience, meaning that the N is greater than or equal to three F plus one and then the algorithm is correct. And now for this work, we consider incomplete graph with uh, directed links. And the motivation is that if we consider a large scale network, then actually the, the network usually is not a click, then it's only partially connected. And then the, the directed link, meaning that for each pair of uh, nodes that they are connected, maybe I'm able to talk to you, but like you are not able to send a message to me. And then this is a very common in wireless channels. And so that I let me kind of formalize the problem is that we want to study the property of the underlying directed graph and to identify the sufficient and necessary condition on that graph so that we can uh, solve Byzantine consensus, uh, Byzantine approximate consensus in asynchronous systems. <coughs> And here is a table that kind of characterizes the, the prior work in this domain. So now this column is a synchronous system. And then uh, this column is for a synchronous system. And we consider uh, then there are work on a directed network. And then we consider this in a directed network. And there's also work on crush consensus, uh, crush failure and Byzantine failure. And back in, <coughs> sorry, back in 2015, we identified a condition for like these three things, but like the problem remains open until now. We finally like figure out the condition for the Byzantine and asynchronous plus direct in this box. And before I go into detail, let me briefly tell you that why directed network is uh, pretty challenging. So this is the, the idea from the undirected graph. So the type condition is basically that you need to have at least two F plus one node disjoint path between each pair of nodes. And the way to see why it's sufficient, it's that because every pair of nodes, you can achieve reliable communication. So for example, in this graph, suppose V3 is a uh, Byzantine, then between any other pair of nodes, you still have like two node disjoint path that you, you can receive message reliably from the source. And then from there, you can simulate any kind of algorithm in a click, then the problem is solved. But for direct graph, the problem is a bit tricky because that all pair reliable communication actually is not necessary because that uh, you may have only one way communication from A to B. Suppose in this case, A can already solve uh, consensus. And then what B needs to do is just uh, to receive the message from A and then uh, decide that there's an output. So the challenge one is that we need to deal with this kind of asymmetric information flow. And then the challenge two is uh, uh, we thought that's very interesting. We, we identify a family of graphs such that I do something like the graph here. So upper like rectangle here is a click of seven nodes. And then the low bottom uh, rectangle here is also a click of uh, seven nodes. But the interesting thing is that there are only four directed edges from one click to the other click. And then we show that this graph actually can tolerate two Byzantine failure. 
And then why this is interesting is that a priori, we cannot be sure that there is a reliable communication from one click to the other click. And then somehow that like, we can solve consensus in this graph. Okay, and then the, here is that the, the name of our condition. Unfortunately, I will, it will take me like three minutes to describe the condition details. So like, uh, I don't have time to do that. If you are interested, I encourage you to read the paper. But like we, uh, we identify a new formulation of the condition of our prior paper. And then it's nicely formed like one reach, two reach, and three reach. An interesting thing for this is that for the Byzantine case, synchronous condition and asynchronous condition is exactly the same. But like for crush case, the condition for synchronous case and asynchronous case is different. Okay. So yeah, let me quickly describe the algorithm structure for you. So the intuition is that the three reach condition will ensure enough redundancy from one set of nodes to the other set so that we can always flood enough message and then through all the possible path. And then inspired by the AAD paper, we also use a similar witness techniques so that somebody tell us that what the message said they have received and then we need to receive all that kind of message and then we can perform the, this uh, kind of filtering message and then update the state and yeah there are lots of detail and then please check our technical report in the paper and then some interesting uh, open problem is that the the uh, three reach condition or even one reach or two reach is a uh, very difficult to formulate and then we don't have an efficient way to check whether a graph satisfies that condition or not and then right now our uh, protocol is uh, exponential run complexity so that's a interesting problem for us to Im uh, improve the efficiency okay that's all uh, i'm good to take the questions thank you thank you very much so are there questions Okay, I don't see questions in this tab. I don't, I also don't see questions in Zulip. Okay, so if there are no further questions, so thank you very much. Thank you again. And let's move to the next talk. The next talk will be given by Mats Frederik Madsen uh, from IT University of Copenhagen. And it's on the subject of non-equivocation, defining non-equivocation in synchronous agreement systems. I give you, so I unmute you in a second. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Okay, well, thank you. So this is joint work I've done together with the Sir de Bois, and both of us are from the IT University of Copenhagen. The uh, central point here is that we have noticed a discrepancy with the uses of the term non-equivocation in literature. And just to bring you up to speed, uh, equivocation is when a Byzantine faulty process lies in different ways to different uh, other processes. And we've noticed uh, two different paradigms of non-equivocation, namely one which allows processes to equivocate by omit messages, that is, send a message to one process and not send a message to another process when it's supposed to send to both, and another paradigm which does not allow this behavior. So to um, examine the properties or the consequences of these two paradigms, we define each as a fault model in a synchronous uh, agreement system with reliable point-to-point -point channels. And we find the following tight fault bounds. Uh, strong non-equivocation has a uh, n greater than t, where n is a number of processes and t is, uh, t is a number of faulty processes. Uh, fault tolerance for broadcast agreement and interact consistency, while it has an n greater than 2t fault tolerance for consensus. 
Meanwhile, weak non-equivocation has a n greater than 2t4 tolerance for all three problems uh, and is, to the best of our knowledge, the only fault model which has an n greater than 2t4 tolerance for broadcast agreement and interactive consistency. So we say that we formally define these uh, notions as fault models, and we do that in the framework of Pierce, Shostak, and Lampard from their paper, Reaching Agreement in the Presence of Faults. Um, the formal definition is on top here. The intuition is that each round, a process must atomically either send the same message to all other processes or send no message at all. This yields a one round in greater than T solution to broadcast agreement and essentially models a broadcast channel in the sense that um, a broadcast channel, a broadcast channel uh, ensures reliable delivery of a message sent on the channel and that is also what we achieve by any message sent by a faulty process under strong non-equivocation. Weak non-equivocation, on the other hand, you have the formal uh, definition on top here. Uh, the intuition is that a faulty process can choose to send a message or not to each recipient. However, for each round, all messages sent must be the same. This yields a T plus one round N greater than two T solution to broadcast agreement and essentially models a solution to the problem known as Crusader Agreement. So uh, for those of you not familiar with Crusader Agreement, it is a slight weakening of the broadcast agreement problem where we have a source and a number of non-faulty processes that have to agree on the value of the source. Uh, Crusader Agreement weakens the agreement property by letting processes that know that the source is faulty uh, not agree on a value. They don't have to agree on a value if they know the source is faulty. And that is exactly what we achieve in the weak non-equivocation fault model. If a process receives a, a message, it knows that every other non-faulty process that also received a, a message must have received the same message. And if a process that does not receive a message, then we can, uh, we can be sure that the, uh, that the source of that message is faulty. And that's quite interesting because it seems to indicate that uh, any um, uh, component that, uh, that gives us non-equivocation is actually a crusader agreement oracle, and uh, at least in the synchronous, uh, synchronous world, uh, and thus that um, any, uh, any algorithm that uses a crusader agreement oracle could just as well use a weak non-equivocation uh, component. Now, we've uh, defined these notions as fault models, and that, of course, means that they have a relationship to other known fault models. Um, one interesting case here is that between the authenticated Byzantine fault model, where faulty processes cannot uh, report wrongly or lie about non-faulty processes messages, and that of weak non-equivocation. So, uh, Intuitively, it seems that the authenticated Byzantine uh, fault model may be strictly stronger than weak non-equivocation. However, it turns out that there are actually runs in both of the fault models that are not encompassed by the other. For instance, if in a run, if a process, faulty process lies about the, process, uh, the value sent by a non-faulty process, but does not equivocate, it is uh, encompassed by the weak non-equivocation fault model, but not by the authenticated Byzantine fault model. There exist examples for the reverse as well. So that is essentially my talk. Uh, the main results are on screen. Uh, thank you for, for listening and questions are more than welcome. So thank you very much. Let us see whether there are questions. So there's a question in chat, I see, what is the difference between weak non-equivocation and omission faults? So uh, the, the big difference is that in the omission fault model, processes are not allowed to lie. That is, uh, you, they, they report correctly, but they can, can omit certain messages. For weak non-equivocation, processes are still allowed to lie, they're just not allowed to equivocate on their lies or equivocate messages. Then there's a question okay. about the asynchronous model. Um, so this is not part of the work here, but it is uh, certainly a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, 
area to examine these things in, um, I would uh, hesitate to say anything specific because it's not part of the work, but I would love to discuss it um, offline maybe. So should I continue reading questions or will you? The next question is how do these fault models relate to the old identical Byzantine and reliable broadcast? So uh, the strong non-equivocation fault model is more or less uh, exactly a, uh, a model of the reliable broadcast, um, which, uh, which is kind of the point here, right? We see that, uh, that strong non-equivocation, uh, this notion has transformed into a, uh, this, the paradigm of non-equivocation in that paradigm is almost exactly a reliable broadcast. And this, this is why it's, it's very, very important and very interesting to see how these different notions uh, differ. Uh, it's also interesting that when we apply the same technique uh, as realizing where a strong non-equivocation is somewhat similar to reliable broadcast, uh, to weak non-equivocation, we see that it's somewhat uh, um, similar to the Crusader agreement problem, which is what I went through before. Okay, the next question is by Elaine. She, sorry, I came in to talk late. Even without non-equivocation, you can do expect constant round. So why is your result interesting? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Uh, one, one thing could be that we have differing, uh, different fault tolerances here, uh, which, um, and one of them are unique for the, for the known fault models, I think. So the, the so here is in the chat, there is also this, maybe it's a uh, bit more precise. Can you just use a Byzantine agreement protocol with signature and replace the signature with your non-equivocation -equiv primitive? No, so this is exactly uh, the thing here. Uh, let me see if I can change my slides. Um, the signature scheme that, that you, 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 uh, you discuss here is the authenticated Byzantine fault model. And what we notice here is that uh, the uh, authenticated Byzantine fault model and the weak non-equivocation are uh, slightly overlapping, but both have runs that are not encompassed by the other. So you cannot achieve uh, non-equivocation by in the authenticated Byzantine model, and you cannot achieve authentication in the weak non-equivocation model. They need to, you need to have components for, for, uh, for each thing. And there is a question from Agita Tia uh, to echo Jennifer's question. How is weak non-equivocation related to identical Byzantine failures? So I am not familiar with the notion of identical Byzantine failures. I would love to discuss that offline if that's okay. Okay, so it's probably the best if you discuss this offline. Um, I don't see questions in Zulip. So then, if there are no more questions, then thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. again. And we go to the first to the first uh, talk, to the first BA talk today. Uh, and this talk is given by uh, Ashish. I don't know, I have to. I have to, but I don't, don't see Ashish actually in the, in the chat. Ah, now I, I see him. Can you, ah yeah, now you should be unmuted. Can you say something so that we can hear okay, you? So, can you hear me? Yes, very well. So the next talk is, can you just go? The next talk is uh, on almost surely terminating asynchronous Byzantine agreement protocols with a constant expected running time. And um, Ashish will give the talk. So please. Thank you. So in this work, we study the problem of 
asynchronous Byzantine agreement. So the setting is as follows. We are given a set of N mutually distrusting parties and we are in the pairwise secure channel model. And we have up to T Byzantine faults. Each party has a private bit, VI has an input, and we want to design a protocol achieving three properties, agreement, validity, and termination. Agreement means all honest parties should have the same output bit. Validity means if all the honest parties started with the same input bit P, then that should be the final output. And since we are in the asynchronous setting, we require the termination property that if all the honest parties participate in the protocol, then eventually all the honest parties should terminate the protocol. So there are some well-known results in the domain of ABA. We have the classic FLP impossibility result. which states that any deterministic ABA protocol will have non-terminating runs, even if one party crashes. And to get around this impossibility result, we have uh, a common approach which is used namely to embrace randomness. And we have two class of randomized ABA protocols. The first category called as one minus lambda terminating ensures that the honest parties terminate uh, except with some non-zero probability lambda, whereas almost surely terminating means uh, the honest parties terminate with probability one. And in this work, our focus is on this latter category, namely almost surely terminating AB protocols. And we are interested in protocols which requires constant number of expected constant number of asynchronous rounds. So these are the relevant results in the domain of almost surely terminating ABA protocols. We compare these protocols depending upon the network setting where they are designed, the resilience offered, the expected number of asynchronous rounds and the expected communication complexity. So in this communication complexity, F denotes the finite field over which computations are performed by the parties. So if we compare, if we, consider the non-optimal resilience, namely T less than N over four, then the classic work of Feldman and Michali gave a constant expected round protocol, which has communication of N power six log N log of field size. So we improve that protocol with resilience T less than N over four and uh, get a saving of theta N in the communication complexity. And if we go to the optimal resilience, namely T less than N over three, then we gave a constant expected round protocol, but in a hybrid communication model, where in the hybrid communication model, we assume that the first round is a synchronous communication round, followed by the typical asynchronous communication model. So the high level overview of our protocol is as follows. We follow the blueprint of Feldman and Mikali and reduce the design of AVA protocol to the design of common coin protocol where the common coin is an asynchronous primitive which ensures a common source of randomness for all the honest parties. And the design of common coin is further reduced to the design of another asynchronous pr primitive called asynchronous verifiable secret share. So one of the earlier speakers have already introduced what exactly the, is the ABSS primitive. On a very high level, it ensures that a designated dealer shares a secret in a consistent fashion so that the shared value can be reconstructed during the reconstruction phase. So if we consider the non-optimal setting of T less than N over four, then we propose to plug in the most efficient, perfectly secure ABS scheme by Jodhri, Hirt and Patra, which appeared in this 13 in this framework of Feldman and Mikali, and we get a constant expected round uh, ABA protocol in the full asynchronous setting. But if we go to the hybrid network model where the first round is allowed to be synchronous, then this work of Patra and Ravi, which appeared in 2017, shows that we can design a perfectly secure ABS scheme even with resilience T less than N over three. So we propose to plug in this uh, hybrid setting uh, ABSS in the blueprint of Feldman and Mikali. And the basic idea is that uh, we know that we require con how many constant expected number of ABSS instances in the blueprint of Feldman and Mikali. So utilize the first synchronous round to run those many expected number of ABSS instances and generate the required number of expected coins. So the details are available in the paper. Thank you. Thank you very much. As far as I have seen, there is at least one question. How realistic are hybrid communication models? 
Yes, so hybrid communication models have been studied uh, as far as the theoretical studies, the theoretical viewpoint is there. They are well studied models to bridge the gap between the efficiency gap between the synchronous and asynchronous protocols. Because if we consider fully asynchronous protocols, then they do that both in terms of the number of asynchronous rounds as well as communication complexity. So, hybrid model is a well studied model. And if the number of parties are small and they are not uh, very wide apart, then yes, it's quite realistic to assume that we can somehow ensure that the messages that they exchange during the first round are delivered. Uh, is the synchronous round needed once for many BA instances or once per instance? So the basic idea is that if we see the framework of Feldman and Michali, then assuming we have an ideal AVSS, we know that we need 16 number of expected iterations in the framework of Feldman and Michali. And hence we can calculate in advance how many AVSS instances will be required. So the idea is that in the synchronous round, we trigger those many AVSS instances. Of course, there might be a small probability that those many AVSS instances are not sufficient to lead the AVA protocol towards the termination. And that's a future direction to explore. Can we think of this hybrid model as a dual of partial synchronous model with a global GST? Uh, I'm not sure. I have to think about this. Probably I can take this question offline. Uh, or we can discuss this offline. Then the next question is following. Is, it, is there a lower bound on the number of rounds in the synchronous optimal resilient case? Okay, what is this AAS? Sorry, is this ABSS or uh, uh, coming to its descriptions? So yes, uh, the work of Patra and Ravi shows that one round is necessary and sufficient to design a perfectly secured, uh, verifiable secret sharing scheme in the hybrid network format. Okay, so if there are no further questions, just a second. Thank you. I don't see, okay, I don't see, okay, I don't see any further questions. So thank you very much. And we go further to the next speaker. Uh, the, Next speaker is uh, Eddie Goldweber, and um, the talk is on the significance of consecutive ballots in Paxos. So, Eli, uh, just a second, sorry. Hello, can everyone hear me? Oh, you are. Right. Sorry. Great. Um, hello, my name is Eli Goldweber, and uh, today, I'll introduce the brief announcement on the significance of consecutive ballots in Paxos. This is joint work with Nuda Zhang and Manos Capritzos. The goal of this work is to help extend our theoretical understanding about the fundamentals of Paxos. Paxos, as we know, is an important distributed protocol and is often used as a core building block in many real systems. Even over 20 years since the original publication of Paxos and over 70 plus Paxos related publications later, there still lies this fundamental misconception about the assumptions that grant Paxos its safety. And these assumptions are carried on in the family of Paxos-based protocols. The, the contribution of this work is to help extend our understanding and show how the protocol is more conservative in some aspects than it needs to be. Specifically, I'll outline how the learning criterion is more strict than it needs in order to maintain safety, and how we can leverage this insight to weaken Paxos without sacrificing safety or correctness. It should seem straightforward that the criterion for how values are learned in Paxos is directly uh, linked and maintains the safety property, which says that no two different values can be learned. And that criterion for how values are learned is defined as this. A value is learned if and only if a majority of acceptors send matching accept messages for the same value in the same ballot. With this in mind, let's dive deeper and take a look at how learning actually works in Paxos. Given a learner's perspective where we can see the information the learner has about accept messages it has received in the system, 
we ask the crucial question, is some value in this case x safe to learn? And referring to the criterion on the slide, it might seem evident that the answer is clearly no. There is a majority quorum of acceptors who've accepted the same value, but in different ballots. But in fact, x is safe to learn. And this criterion is really thought to be the bedrock that grants Paxos its safety. And this assumption has largely been taken for granted. But we can revisit this assumption and show that it is sufficient to guarantee correctness, but it's unnecessarily strong or restrictive. The reason why X is safe to learn in this case is because there's a majority quorum of acceptors who've all accepted the same value in consecutive ballots. There's no ballot between, in this case, eight and nine and nine and 10 where a different value could have been proposed or accepted. Furthermore, any future proposer waiting for a quorum of promise messages in order to determine what value is safe to propose will still have a quorum intersection with the quorum outlined on the slide and will be limited to proposing the same value X, which maintains safety. Leveraging this, we can weaken this criterion of learning to say that a value is learned if and only if a majority of acceptors send accept messages for the same value in consecutive ballots. While there are more details in the paper as well as in the longer version of the talk, uh, we have shown and we're able to use formal verification methodologies to create a mechanically checked proof that verifies that both the criterion for learning as well as proposing values via consecutive quorums and consecutive proposals respectively can be safely weakened without sacrificing safety or correctness. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me see, there is one question. Uh, Paxos ballot numbers are actually pairs, ballot number process, process ID. I don't know whether it's a question or... I'm not quite certain if I fully understand the question, but just in the simple, in this simple model um, of dealing with this, as long as the, the ballots or how you define the ballots in terms of um, consecutive nature, and that might depend on the configuration of how these are actually defined, might change from configuration to configuration, but it's still this notion of uh, consecutiveness. Mm -hmm. So um, it uh, made it a bit, a bit more precise. So after one one, we can have one two. Uh, sure, in this case, uh, if, if the process ID is referring to just the different acceptors, then uh, what we're really caring about is the initial ballot, uh, as a, and then the full majority quorum of acceptors that constitute the quorum would be uh, made up of the process ID, if I understood that question correctly. And this would be specific, I see the process ID is of the leader, this would be specific to a, a single leader. Mm -hmm. There is another question also, are ballots authentic, authentic, authenticated? Uh, in the model we were looking at, it was just assuming the uh, sort of the classic Paxos assumptions, uh, so we weren't dealing with any ballot authentication, but uh, I would assume that you'd be able to incorporate that. And then the question with respect to the previous one, if the leader doesn't change, then why does the ballot change? Uh, maybe there is a, a timeout or some other packet dropping that would force the leader to uh, have to propose uh, the same value in maybe a, a, a future ballot. We didn't look so much into how often this might occur, more of just looking at the actual criterion and looking at the assumptions about those. Okay. So there seems to be no further question. Okay, so let's proceed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you again. Then let's go to the next speaker. Shia Cohen is the next speaker. Let me just... Now the micro should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So, mm -hmm. so the next talk is on not a coincidence, subquadratic asynchronous Byzantine agreement. 
uh, I guess WHP means with high probability. And the speaker is Shia Cohen. So okay, thank you. So this is a joint work with my advisor Edith Kedar and Alexander Spiegelman. And uh, what we are trying to do here, we are trying to uh, to cope with large scale system that motivates asynchrony and low communication complexity in the area of Byzantine agreement. And the main uh, solution we provide is we provide the first sub-quadratic asynchronous Byzantine agreement with high probability, which means we have uh, O tilde of n word complexity and we provide safety and liveness properties with high probability. And the main tool we are using is a verifiable run function or VRF for short, which you can think about as uh, if you can just pick a note with the number on it along with the proof of this value and you cannot repick another number. You get what you get. And we use this VRF for two, in two aspects. The first one is we are trying to create a shared coin or a common coin and effectively trying to take this uh, local sense of uh, randomness provided by the VRF and create a shared randomness among all core processes. And the second aspect is the electing committees. So it is common to reduce the communication complexity in algorithm while using committees, meaning that every step of each protocol is being executed only by a subset of processes called the committee. So here, for example, you can see our shared coin procedure. So all processes in purple are elected to the committee. And if they are elected, they speak at this step, at this step of the protocol, for example, in step one. And if they are not elected, they sit silently until the next step. And of course, Byzantine uh, processes cannot speak. I mean, they can speak, but no one would listen because they also used the VRF, but they, they weren't elected. So they cannot provide a proof of their election. So it doesn't matter if they speak because no one would listen. And the problem with uh, the challenge of these protocols is unlike, uh, let's say, Algorand in synchronous uh, model or uh, eventual synchrony, is that we cannot wait for N minus F processes in order to move on for the next step. Right? This is how uh, asynchronous protocols work. I wait for a subset of a certain size of messages in order to continue to the next step. But here we cannot wait for n minus uh, messages because we don't know how many exact, how exactly processes were elected to the committee, nor do we know how many correct processes were elected. So the way we handle it, we define two parameters, uh, W and B. And we use churn of bounds to prove that with high probability in each committee sampling, at least W processes would be correct and at most B processes would be Byzantine. Of course, these two properties are not uh, enough in order to uh, produce a safe algorithm. So we also derived uh, two other properties regarding the, their intersection, for example, any two subsets of size W will intersect in at least B plus one processes. So just to conclude, what we do is we present the first formalization of randomly sampled committees using cryptography in asynchronous settings, and then use the sampling technique to provide the first shared coin and Byzantine agreement, which has a subquadratic word complexity. Thank you. I'll take questions now. Thank you very much. So actually we are a bit short on time, so I suggest to move all questions to Zuli and we should continue with the next talk and the next talk is given by just a second by Pank Pankaj I don't know whether I pronounce your name correctly Now you can speak, I think. Can you just say something? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me share my screen. We 
can you see your screen? It's okay. Okay, so the next talk is on Byzantine agreement with unknown participants and failures. So please start with the talk. So hi, this is Pankaj Kanchanan um, from ETH Zurich, and this is a joint work with Roger Wattenhofer, and I'll be talking about our work on Byzantine agreement with unknown participants and failures. So this is uh, the classic version of the Byzantine agreement problem. In one sentence, each node is given an input value and they must terminate with an output value so that the value output by the correct nodes are identical and this common output value is an input of some correct node. So there is an additional assumption as well that the participants know the size n of the system and an upper bound f on the number of Byzantine failures. In this work, we study the problem when we get rid of this assumption and specifically with respect to how resiliency is affected. So in the rest of the short talk, I will describe the model in a little bit more detail and show where are the interesting problems. So this is, uh, let's say, let's look at an example. We consider a synchronous system. We have four nodes out of which one is presenting. The nodes have identifiers, which they cannot forge, and they also have a power to broadcast a value to all the nodes. However, the Byzantine node can decide uh, itself uh, to get, get itself known to only a subset of participants. So after a round of exchange, it happens that node A thinks that there are four nodes in the system and so does B. However, C does not listen from the Byzantine node, so it only thinks that there are three nodes in the system. In, in particular, C might think from the point of view of C, there can be more nodes in the system that are Byzantine. And so we ask this question whether this resiliency of n greater than 3f is enough. Uh, note that this is necessary because it is necessary even in the case when participants know n and f. What we show is that this is also sufficient. So technically it boils down to electing a leader, well one of the main things, uh, which is kind of very uh, like a uh, simple problem in the setting where n and f are known. There we run the sys to elect a correct leader. We run for f plus one rounds and it ensures that a correct leader is selected. So for example, in round one, we will no select node one as the leader. In round two, we will select node two as the leader. And after two rounds, it will be ensured that the correct, no correct leader is chosen. In our settings, we don't know n and f. So it is kind of unreasonable to assume that the participants have consecutive IDs. So it may happen that for example, node eight thinks that only three nodes are present in the system, four, seven, eight, and node seven thinks that there are four nodes, namely three, four, seven, and eight. Mainly because node three was present in and it kind of tricked the system into believing different, uh, believing different values, like believing uh, in convincing the correct nodes that, uh, just a short interruption. You have this. Uh, you have this. Uh, this uh, tools window in, uh, on the top. This should be re removed from there. Um, we all can see it. Uh, this tools window. How? What should I click to? Maybe. Uh, maybe it goes away now, right? Yeah. Now it's better. All right. Thank you. So yeah, I was just saying here that uh, the, the Byzantine nodes trick the system in such a way that node seven thing, uh, node seven and eight do not agree on whether it is present in the system or not. So for simple things such as, for example, if we say select the smallest ID as the leader node may not work because node eight will select four as the leader and node seven will select three as the leader. However, with a bit of some more work, if we do something like in round i, each node selects ith node as the leader, and if we run, run it long enough, we, might, we, we can ensure that a correct leader is selected. We can also have shorter and longer versions of the protocol, but uh, uh, you can check the paper for details. Um, I'll also check the uh, full version of the talk as well. And just now building on this solution, we can also build the, uh, with, with a little bit of more work, we can also solve the Byzantine agreement problem itself in, uh, with this resiliency. 
So just to conclude, uh, in this model of unknown NNF, uh, this resiliency is optimal and greater than 3F. I told you about the synchronous system because if we have an asynchronous system, uh, this problem is essentially impossible because the nodes do not know how long to wait before they decide anything because they cannot count messages anymore. Or, and so for the further thing that we look uh, we're looking into is like what happens if it is semi-synchronous also when participants change over time. So thank you very much uh, and I will be happy to take questions or talk about it further. Thank you very much. Uh, so I suggest also in this case to move all the discussions to the Zuli. And uh, well, this was basically the first session today of POTSI. So thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you to all the thanks to all the speakers. And um, yeah, the uh, the conference continues in. I think it in fifty yeah in ten, fifteen minutes, in ten minutes, I guess. So thank you very much. Thank you again and see you in ten minutes. If the speakers of the next session are already here.